and we are live. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Um, my name is Yuri. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Uh, and I thank you for coming. Today we are going to talk about static analysis and how static analyzers are made and specifically about type system which we use. So about me. Mm, just. I'm a C++ developer at PVS Studio. If you don't know, we are developing a static analyzer for C++ mainly, also for C Sharp and Java. I'm working on the core module. Uh, it says here that I also write diagnostic rules, but uh, not anymore. Mainly it's core. And what is this talk about, really? Well, several things. Well, first, um, if any of you don't know yet, I'll briefly tell you what uh, static analysis is and why it's useful, uh, what it has inside, like kind of how it's built. Uh, we are going to focus on the type system for C and C++ because that's Oh, the hot topic here um, in PVS Studio right now. And I'm working on it intensively. And I'll just give you a small comparison of what it used to be and what it's going to be and what, like, the stage it's now. Uh, but first, <clears throat> What's a static analyzer, right? Um, I think it's a term which is not so obscure these days, but still um, it's not very common, let's say, uh, let's say it like that. Well, static analysis is basically an automated code review, or you can look at it as, well, as some kind of a compiler which doesn't really compile anything, but it uh, makes other useful things happen. So how a compiler is built? Uh, we need this to understand the structure of uh, the system. Uh, every compiler these days basically has some parts. Um, first and foremost, it's front end. It's where you feed your um, source code and you get your um, syntax and semantics of your program analyzed and the result of that is a syntax tree. Um, it has usually some kind of intermediate representation. Uh, in Clang it's called IR and then uh, this thing goes to the middle end so-called. Uh, the middle end module does some platform independent optimizations on your code, on your abstract representation. Then the IR goes further and then it goes to the back end, uh, which creates assembly code. It does some platform dependent optimizations and you get an object file which is then linked to an executable or a library. So. Uh, I think everyone knows this, um, just a reminder. Now, what's a static analyzer, basically? It's the same thing, except for code generation and optimization. So again, we still have a front end here, uh, which does mostly the same things uh, the compiler does. And then, uh, next, uh, we get, instead of that IR middle end back end thing, we get diagnostic rules which work on your, um, basically on the abstract syntax tree. It has also some mechanisms like data flow to track um, variable changes throughout the program, uh, but it's not too important right now. So. Diagnostic rules of a static analyzer are like compiler's warnings, but they um, 
they can afford to give you more information and complain about things a compiler won't complain about uh, because the compiler has a job of creating your executable and diagnosing something which does not affect um, compilation it's not really uh, its job so to speak okay so this was a short intro into what we're dealing with so let's go back to types uh, which is the main topic right uh, in C++ and C we have quite a huge number of types and quite a type system uh, in all honesty so oh, what do we have we have built-ins we have so-called derived types we have user-defined types also built-ins are your ints floats a void is also a built-in null pointer uh, all this stuff which the compiler just knows about um, then derived types are pointers arrays which are just pointers really in disguise references uh, they would like to be pointers but they kind of cannot and functions which also boil down to pointers in the end so derived types are basically pointers for the most part and user defined types are structures, classes, unions, and enumerations. Um, I don't mention templates here because templates are just another language within the language. Um, they make your life easier, but they make life of compiler guys a little bit harder, I think. Uh, and the best part I love about it is that all the types are interconnected in weird ways sometimes and they are convertible to each other so it's quite a complex system uh, this uh, thing doesn't even start to represent the entire complexity but anyway let's say you want to create um, a C++ or C compiler I don't know why but let's say you want to how would you represent types in your front end in order to correctly determine um, the way uh, um, what data at which point of the program is used okay so there are two schools of thought I guess you can say on this um, there's an old way which I think started it all um, is representing types with uh, just encoded strings so let's look at this declaration here uh, it's a pointer to a const int so what we do with it we just take every part of this type and put it in a string so it's a pointer which is the letter P in our system anyway uh, const will be uh, applied to whatever is under the pointer and int is kind of easy and also we've got this um, cute character here which represent a null terminator of course now the other approach you could take to types is well basically this <clears throat> you just take uh, everything you know about types in your language and you somehow implement the entire scheme with uh, interrelations in your um, in your front end now those approaches they have both have advantages and disadvantages uh, just a spoiler it so happens that our analyzer for C++ and C uh, uses the first approach because it's kind of an old code base 
Okay, so let's take a quick look at encoded uh, strings. So they, of course, have advantages, and the advantages are they are more cache friendly because your string is always located in memory contiguously. I tried to think about other advantages of this approach and uh, frankly I couldn't uh, I couldn't find any so I guess that's it and of course strings are kind of slow because you have to iterate over them all the time um, algorithms of working with strings and looking something up inside and dealing with characters and so on are quite inefficient and you might need and probably you will need to pass over the same thing multiple times in order to get all your information all the information you want otherwise you risk losing information and if, if you say cut the string into pieces uh, you risk losing information unless you keep everything uh, memorized and then again it's a whole pass over the same thing uh, again and mm, strings are not at least in C++ are not the most convenient thing to work with in C++ it's better than in C but still also there is one tiny issue if you want to encode everything in a string so these are comments from our code from the module which deals with encoding and as you can see there are quite a few letters used here and that's even not the entire thing and the choice of letters is sometimes questionable let's say we have z for null pointer of there at the right so why is it z um, where's the logic well the logic is simple z was available it was free so it was used uh, in other words we are running out of letters and if you try to encode everything you will probably run out of letters um, just to give you an example what um, you would be dealing with if you had encoded uh, types in your compiler or whatever is this so let's try to guess uh, what a string represent each uh, each type here so for this int pointer I think it's easy I think everyone can easily get this um, there's a different example when you declare a class you want to know about this class of course you want it uh, to know its type and if you encode it you will get something like that um, this little group of characters in front of the name uh, it's they represent the length of the string which will follow uh, of this substring. Okay, um, a more elaborate example, I guess. So it's the main function we know and love uh, and what it looks like. Um, it looks like that. It's kind of, <clears throat> I think, obvious here uh, what everything represents. Uh, if we read it left, right, uh, we will read it like that it's a function which takes int as a parameter which takes a pointer to pointer to const char as the next parameter and it returns an int um, not the best thing in the world here because if you want to get uh, the functions return type or say the second parameter or whatever parameter you want uh, you will have to traverse the string or you will have to come up with some caching and stuff like that 
Um, and this uh, is an example I really like. Uh, it's my favorite one, to be honest. If anyone can guess it, um, you're a genius, but because I had to copy and paste it uh, from a real debugging session, and it goes like that. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, and that stuff is not really obvious. And you really have to understand how this thing is organized to do something with it. Which is, well, it's not abstracted well. Okay. Um, those issues with encodings are really minor <clears throat> because you can get used to everything. Um, what uh, is a more mm, serious problem is, as I said at the beginning, is slowness. And the slowness goes uh, from, well, basically, the fact that you need to really understand what uh, those words in encodings mean. Uh, here's an example. It's completely synthetic. Uh, we have type and fo, uh, a type and fo class in our code, uh, which has some interface methods. And in this specific example, let's say we get some type from somewhere and we want to know if it's a function or not. Let's see what happens. Um, usually a check like that um, is a quick bug out check, so to speak, uh, so you can easily leave. If, um, if you don't want to run all the further uh, logic, if something is not good for you in this case. So is it a quick bug out check really um, as it wants to be? Well, let's see. We'll take a look inside that specific function and there's a lot of going on here. The actual check uh, whether it's function or not is at the very bottom when you actually uh, check it for letter F which is, as we saw, uh, is a marker that we are dealing with a function. It's at the start. Uh, but the question I usually ask uh, people who see this first, I mean, people here in our team, uh, is how many loops do you see in this picture? Well, how many? Well, obviously, the function itself doesn't have a loop. But we have two really uh, suspicious calls here. The first one, um, I'll talk about it a little bit later. The second one uh, just goes over a string and it basically uh, skips uh, every uh, const volatile uh, markers, uh, ellipsis arguments, and so on. So it's a loop. Uh, we've got one at least. And the normalized one, the first one, well, it's a pain. So it checks uh, CV qualifiers of your type and it sets uh, flags for them for later use. Uh, it resolves type devs. Uh, in your encoding, you may not have this beautiful uh, function signature, you may have something which has been um, some alias for, for the type. It also tries to figure out your templates and if you, are, you have a class, it will give you information about that class also. Uh, everything, the results of that function is usually a changed encoding or additional information added to the 
uh, object itself. Okay, so this one is obviously, uh, it goes over the string. This one uh, goes to the symbol table in the current in the current scope to look up the symbol. Um, this one we'll just keep because it's too, um, how to say it, um, it's too obscure. It does some magic uh, which doesn't always work. And for classes you again go and look at the simple table. Now what do we have inside of those? Uh, this one is obviously a loop. This one probably is just a lookup in the in the hash map, right? Well, actually not because it's recursion. Because you may have type defs inside type defs inside templates and so on, and it uses this thing again. This one is heavy recursion and it loops back to type defs and usings and stuff like that. This one is also recursion because you may want to figure out all those things first. Okay, so mm, encoded strings for types may not look too bad, but they are too bad. Really. Now, so why am I telling you this? Well, because because of that, because if you want to check something, if you want to check if something is a function, it must be simple and quick. And at some point we decided that um, we need to come up with a better system. So the better system, how would it look like? Uh, you know, at this point I'll play Captain Obvious and I'll say that it was a brilliant idea. Um, types in C++ and C are a sort of kind of a hierarchy. So hey, why don't we represent them with a hierarchy of classes and just throw those stupid strings away? And so we did. Um, here I want to take a moment and just praise clan because it was an inspiration uh, for me when I was developing the type system. I didn't copy it exactly of course because we have different um, goals with clan but uh, it was really helpful. Uh, its source code is good and the compiler itself is excellent so thank you. Uh, thank you clan. Now this uh, hierarchy of classes to represent a hierarchy of entities. Uh, how it looks, uh, what it looks like. So we've got the base class for type which represents just any type. And inside it, uh, it has an ID because we need to understand what we are looking at. We are dealing ba uh, mostly with a pointer to the base class. Uh, so IDs are different for different types. Uh, it has canonical type, a so-called canonical type. I'll tell you what it is a little bit later. And all the derived classes uh, which you can uh, produce for different stuff like pointers, references, classes, and so on, uh, they contain specific information. Uh, if you take a pointer type, it will uh, have information about the type it's pointing to, so you can easily extract it. Now, remember our code from the beginning with the function check. Well, uh, here's basically the same fragment but uh, with a new type system and again it's a quick bug out check uh, or is it? Well let's see. So the function with many loops and recursions 
um, turns into this. You can check multiple types at once and it just involves checking a single uh, field basically in the uh, type class. And this field is a char, essentially. Uh, the type itself is kind of small. Um, so that's the idea. I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, what may not be obvious is what a canonical type even is. So let's look at this example. We have an int variable and obviously it's an int uh, so it's a built-in type and its canonical type will be also built-in. In this case uh, the type itself and its canonical representation are the same. But things get more interesting when you move to aliases. So let's say you uh, want to create uh, an alias for int and have a variable of that. Uh, type of A will be here this. So the type itself is an alias. It's a type def. Uh, we need this information so we carry it around. And the canonical is what's under the type def. Uh, the main reason for having this canonical representation is to avoid um, dealing with aliases when you don't need to. Uh, it also serves different purposes like for template uh, specializations uh, but uh, mainly it's for resolving aliases. Uh, so what I mean by you won't, uh, you won't have to deal with uh, aliases when you don't really need to is if you take a look at that you have quite a small alias chain here but they can grow really long and um, type devs to type devs and so on and to figure out the resulting type of a um, we need to take a look basically at canonical. So let's um, let's take a look at A here and I'll just show you uh, what it consists of. So it's an alias, it's a using. Uh, we also need to know that for different reasons in diagnostic rules. Its canonical type is uh, built-in int and it may look here like we are losing information that this is an alias to an alias, but no, really, um, we have a source uh, for the alias uh, in this case. Uh, what it helps us do is you can easily extract the underlying type to which all those chains of type devs are pointing to and also you can walk the chain if you want to. Uh, so using the source um, of the alias you can just you can just unroll the entire chain if you need to and yeah sometimes it's needed. So overall um, as I said we have the base type uh, and derived types. Um, derived classes in our hierarchy. So here we have built-ins. Uh, don't worry, um, there are not too many of them. Uh, built-ins are uh, complex type from C. Pointers, uh, arrays, uh, member pointers. Um, also references, which are of different kinds. We have R value, L value and forwarding references. We have classes, we have class member types because a class member is not just its type, it's also the real thing, the declarator for it. Uh, enums, uh, of course, aliases, functions uh, and not all functions are born equal, so we have constructors, we have just plain functions, constructors, destructors, 
operators of which the assign operator is a unique thing because it can only happen in, inside the class. Uh, also cost operators which are not really operators but rather conversion functions. Uh, of course we need a way to represent auto and decal types. Uh, we've got templates, template variables which kind of differ from plain templates. Uh, template parameters get their own type, template speci uh, specializations get their own type. Also for different type conversions uh, we want to track uh, how did we get to some point. So we, we've got adjusted types which are basically types where that underwent some represent um, some changes, some operations on them. Deduce types you get from auto, decay you get as a result of decaying, uh, an array for example, uh, sub-template arcs you get from of course substituting template arcs when instantiating uh, a template. Uh, for parameter packs there is its own type and you get template instances. Um, it, it covers pretty much everything we need right now from our type system. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but I kind of dropped the topic, which is an important one, but um, I just didn't talk about it. Uh, it's the topic of qualifiers. I, you get all those types, it, it's great and fine, but what if you write const or better yet, if you write something like that. So here we have a built-in type which is an int, but we also have two qualifiers attached to it. And in our type system we have type IDs, right? So would the solution for representing this thing be something like that? Uh, I think it's fear inducing, at least it scares me when I look at that. So really, no, um, we are not going to do this scary thing to anyone. So what shall we do? Well, again, that's the idea I borrowed from Clang and again that's probably the best um, thing I borrowed from them. I like this concept very much. Uh, the concept is called call type. Um, call type is a type to which qualifiers are applied and how it works is interesting. So under the hood it's just a type pointer so we can look at it as a pointer. Uh, what makes it special is um, if I asked you uh, how many bytes of address you have on a 64-bit system what would you answer? Most people, I think, would say 8. Uh, we are talking systems like Windows, Linux, Mac, uh, the big three. Uh, people who think that we have 8 bytes of address on those systems are kind of right, but at the same time they're kind of wrong because uh, you actually don't get to access everything in your address space. Uh, in user mode uh, when you are in your regular application a pointer contains an address in memory and a byte of zeros. Uh, this is because this byte there is reserved for system users. Uh, it's not accessible, uh, it's always zeroed out. I think CPUs these days um, 
either they can automatically drop it in user mode or they are going to be able to do it at some point. Uh, so that looks like a waste of space, but really it isn't because that's what uh, helps us to represent different qualifiers on different types. So basically what we do, we take this byte here, we put an address to the actual type instance to the seven bytes we have for address. And in this little zero byte, we just put some bits. So we store const, volatile and restrict uh, for C there. And we've got five spare bits really. So what I'm going to, um, the way to represent qualifiers for types is not to put them inside types, but rather apply them to a pointer which points to the corresponding type. And it works great because those call types, they behave like pointers. You can copy them around, they're lightweight, uh, they don't cost you anything and you can store them anywhere you want and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so it's just a pointer again. It has qualifiers, it has a pointer to the base class. Uh, of course, it doesn't store it inside as a pointer. It uh, reinterprets it as a number. Uh, but anyway, uh, otherwise, uh, you can just dereference it like a regular pointer. You can use the arrow operator and all that good stuff. Okay, so how does it fit together in the grand, grand scheme of things? Uh, we've got our type system, which is actually a factory which produces types. Um, you cannot create a type instance yourself you have to ask a special class to do that for you. And the reason for that is uh, the cache. Why cache? Because you really don't want to have a lot of instances of say int in your, inside your compiler or static analyzer because they will clutter your memory and how, um, how will you know if they are the same type if you have multiples? You can of course compare their IDs and information from within them, but um, it won't be too efficient. So this factory uh, class, which is called type system, it hashes uh, the types it creates based on what you pass uh, to to its functions which actually make types. So every, like every int will be uh, just a single instance in your uh, application. Every pointer to int will be just a single instance in your application and so on and so forth. So every function, every class, if they have, um, if they are the same type, you will have only one instance and uh, just to, for convenience, because we are passing call types around, uh, you cannot really mm, re uh, rely on um, the types methods. Uh, you will lose qualifiers otherwise. The type system provides traits. Uh, traits are like type traits from the standard library. They basically do the same things, but uh, during runtime. Okay, so what profit do we get from it? Um, types are mutable. Once created, they can be changed and you cannot break them in any way like that. Um, types are single instance objects, not singletons, but single instance. There's only one of each. 
Uh, you can compare types really by hash values. Um, it makes your life easier. And those call type pointers, they're not nullable. They have unresolved uh, types, so-called, under the hood if, uh, if you default construct them. You can dereference them, nothing bad uh, is going to happen. Okay, so uh, yes, I guess it's good. Let's see what we have actually inside uh, our type classes. So the base class is really simple. You can ask it uh, for its ID, which is stored here. ID is just an enum uh, uh, with the uh, unsigned char as its underlying type. Um, this one checks for unresolved. Uh, we can check if it's some kind of auto and do something about it. We can get its canonical. Uh, you can wrap it into qualifiers and produce a qual type like that. And you can know its size and alignment, uh, which are working through uh, type system again. Um, this hash is for um, for the factory. It uses it uh, to identify types uh, by its own means. And basically that's it. So that's the whole um, base class for the type. And let's take a look also at some derived one. Uh, we cannot, unfortunately, go in too much detail about this, but um, I guess I will just give you an overview. So let's take a look at the pointer type. It's inherited from the base type class, and what information it adds as compared to its uh, base class, you can dereference it and it stores a call type of the thing it points to with all the qualifiers. And this is just a quality of life feature. You can quickly check what the pointer is pointing to. Um, in this scheme, even though we have um, a class hierarchy, we decided to go really against polymorphic uh, usage. Uh, so no virtual functions there. Uh, let's take a hypothetical function which wants to know if you have a pointer which points to an int. It has a stupid name, but it will do. So how the way we would do that with en encodings, we would just traverse the string character by character and try to figure out uh, what's what. Uh, here it becomes quite simple. We just try to cast uh, our type to a pointer. If we fail, we just bug out. If we don't fail, we dereference it, try to get it as a built-in type and do a, a check like that. So it's quite simple. It's less verbose than it would be with uh, encodings. And I think it works faster, really. Um, well, this try get as function you saw there is a dynamic cast, which is not a dynamic cast, really. Uh, it can cast your type pointer you get from call type based on its ID to another to the derived class you want. Uh, there are two versions of it. Um, it, it can um, cast by type you give it or by ID. Uh, and this two function there, it just, it just does that basically. So it, it just utilizes static cast. Otherwise, it's null pointer. Very close to how dynamic cast would work. And this thing here, 
is a set of uh, template templates uh, for each type, which um, mm, correspond uh, types with IDs. I made a cardinal sin here by creating macros, but this is um, what when you create a new derived class from the base type, this is what you should call and give it the type name and the ID. Uh, and remember I talked about traits. There's another way to do the same thing. Again, the same stupid function. Uh, you can do it like that. Check if it's pointer, remove pointer, try get as built in and go uh, just check if it's in it. Um, and those trade things, they mimic what we have here. This, this is a screenshot from CP reference. And those are screenshots from our code, really. Uh, they just are the same, basically, which we use in in our code and uh, just to deal with call types in the same basically way we would do in our code at compile time if we wanted to use type trace from the standard library. Um, well, here's just an example of how a trade is implemented. Let's look at DK. Uh, if we just check the way DK works, uh, we can code it quite easily. So first remove const volatile and reference from your type. Our functions become function pointers, arrays become pointers to uh, underlying elements. Um, yeah, this way you can manipulate all those things inside your code base. And now the final how it fits together part. So let's say we get this uh, as our input. This piece of code, it goes to the parser. The parser makes an AST. It's a declaration statement, obviously. Then uh, types get determined. Um, here for a pointer, we get a, the resulting type as a pointer to int. This wrap there in the first line, it uh, says create a call type which has empty qualifiers because we don't have const or volatile here or anything. Uh, this type is assigned to the AST node uh, which has been created. And this AST node later gets into a diagnostic rule and here you can use traits uh, to work with it uh, and determine its type. Or you can use different ways uh, like uh, addressing the type itself. And we are running out of time. Uh, so yeah, just, just as a summary. Um, this was a brief introduction in what we have as a type system, really. Uh, and um, I just don't have time to elaborate really on that. Uh, I could talk about it for hours. Maybe if this topic interests someone, I can uh, turn it into a series of talks and uh, give you more information on any specifics we have inside. Uh, but in any case, uh, thank you everyone who was listening to me. And I think right now, since we have a little bit of time, I'll see if we got any questions and then I'll just answer whatever I get. Otherwise, thank you. And that's it. Mm. I don't think we have any questions really. Unless I'm missing something.
Uh, just a quick check. Okay, so no questions. So thank you again, everyone uh, who was listening. And that's it for me. Have a nice day.